mind Yeah, all I need in thee To find, O oh, Lamb of God I come, I come Christ has died, Christ has risen Christ will come again In his great mercy God made us alive in Christ Even when we were dead in our sins Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy Christmas boxes was an advent calendar. And it was made out of purple cloth and it was the calendar that was meant to be hung on the wall. We always hung it on the door that led into the basement. And on the bottom of the calendar were 24 little pockets about an inch by an inch. And on the top of the calendar was a Christmas tree that had at least one half of a snap sewn on in 24 different places. And so every day leading up to Christmas, starting with December 1st, we take out one of the little ornaments and put it on the tree. And, and the ornaments will include things like the shepherd's staff, to remind us about the shepherds who were out when they heard the angel's announcement. Or, or it might be a crown to remind us of the wise men, the, the people from the east who came sometime later to visit the baby Jesus. Or there was always a star, and that went way up on the top to remind us of the star that appeared over Bethlehem. All these things were intended to sort of help us prepare to celebrate Christ's birth. At first, you don't have to look very far to see a lot of people preparing right now. If you, if you drive around the neighborhood, you might see people putting up Christmas lights on the outside of their house. If you drive out by the woods, you might see you know, people with Christmas trees strapped to the roof of their car or in the bed of their pickup. 
If you go shopping, you can see all sorts of sales because the stores want you to do your Christmas shopping at their store. Now, of course, if you're all night, well, maybe you're going to have family. Maybe you're going to have friends or, or maybe you're preparing for a trip to visit someone else or maybe you just have to worry about getting all your Christmas shopping done. There's a lot of things that have to happen in December for us to prepare. But as we worry about all the different things that are going on during this month, we also want to take time to prepare mentally, prepare spiritually. Not only for the first time that Jesus came into this world, not only to celebrate his birth, but also to prepare for the time when he's going to return in glory. I don't necessarily need to do that with an Advent calendar, but it is good to take time to contemplate God's grace in sending his son into this world. It is good to take time to contemplate that eternal hope that God has prepared for us. As we look at our scripture reading for this morning, that's exactly what John the Baptist was doing. He was preparing the people. He was preparing them spiritually with a message of repentance to turn away from sin and turn to the Lord. And as we go into the Advent season once again this year, we want to prepare the way. And the way we do it is we prepare the way by coming before the Lord with repentant hearts and trusting in the one who has come to save us. We turn once again to our gospel lesson. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made out of camels here, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptized, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axes are ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce Good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the word of our Lord. <coughs> Now, one thing that really strikes us as we look at this lesson about John the Baptist is that this didn't happen by accident. Matthew quotes from the prophet Isaiah, and it's interesting because Isaiah lived 700 years before John was born, and yet he talks about the fact that this voice would prepare the way for Jesus to come into the world. It didn't happen by accident, but John began his ministry at God's time so that Jesus could also begin his public ministry. And just like John acted according to God's timetable, John also gave a message that wasn't his own, but instead had been given to him by God. And, and since it's really God's message, it was really just in line with what all the Old Testament prophets had spoken of before. It was a message of repentance. And so, in a sense, it shouldn't really be anything new, because even, even John's appearance was intended to remind people of those Old Testament prophets. We read in the book of 1 Kings, where we read about Elijah, it says he was a man with a garment of hair and with a leather belt around his waist. Everything about John, from where he preached, the message he proclaimed, was intended to remind people of that 
Old Testament message of repentance that had been proclaimed for centuries. And yet, as we look at our lesson, when we see people going out to John the Baptist, part of the reason that they were going out to see this man out in the wilderness was because he was proclaiming the message that they weren't used to. Instead of proclaiming God's message of repentance that had been given by the Old Testament prophets, so often what the people heard was, well, it's all up to you. It's about you and the good works that you can offer to God. It's about making yourself appear more righteous than you really are. It's about puffing yourself up so that you think you're worthy of standing in God's presence. But to answer that type of an attitude, John asked the people to take a realistic look at themselves. Instead of just point, puffing themselves up and pointing out all the good things that they have done, John the Baptist wanted people to realize that if they really wanted to be able to stand before God, it would take nothing less than perfection. It would take nothing less than living as people not only outwardly righteous, but as people who had pure hearts and pure motives. As the Lord had said to Samuel in, in, in the Old Testament, the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And if they had fallen short even a little bit, even in their hearts, there was only one option. And that was to simply throw themselves on God's mercy, confess their sin, and plead for his grace. But we can see that especially when those religious leaders went out to John the Baptist. Now, those religious leaders were people who were highly respected, at least in an outward way. They were people who did what was right. They were people whom so many looked up to. Well, when they came out to see John the Baptist, he said, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? You brood of vipers. He connects them to that old ancient serpent that we heard about in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell into sin. They looked very, very good on the outside, but God allowed John to understand what was underneath. There was all sorts of sin and corruption, and for them too, there was only one option. To come before the Lord in repentance. Instead of trying to hide sin and guilt, to simply come before the Lord and plead for his mercy. God wasn't afraid to let the full force of God's law and God's justice answer their own self-righteousness. And, and notice he even took away their trust in their family tree by saying, if you really want to be a descendant of Abraham, Abraham it has to do a lot more with what God can do than with blood. Now, even though it's not a message that we necessarily like to hear, our human nature likes to hear, that message of repentance is still one that we need to hear. When we come before God, it can't depend on what we can do. Now, now, our human nature likes to try to puff itself up, right? Sort of like many of the people during Jesus' day were taught. In fact, what we try to do is make ourselves look all nice and shiny. Sort of like when you wrap a Christmas present, you know, you're hiding what's underneath, at least for a time. And so we want the paper to look just right. And, and we do that with ourselves. We try to make ourselves look so good and hide what's underneath. But once again, if we want to stand before God, it has to do a lot more than just our appearance. If we stand before God, we have to have pure hearts, pure motives. But of course, by nature, we know that's not how we are. In fact, the Apostle Paul describes how we are by nature when he says in Ephesians, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. By nature, we were dead like those lifeless stones that 
John the Baptist was pointing to. And so instead of trying to make excuses, and of trying to cover up our sin and guilt, there really is only one option. And that's to come before the Lord in repentance. Come before the Lord confessing our sin and guilt. Come before the Lord saying, Lord, I really don't have anything to offer you, but you promise to be gracious. You promise to be merciful. Lord, I come before you. Trust me in your promise. And notice that when the people came out and they confessed their sins before John the Baptist, he didn't leave them in despair. But he shared God's grace with them in a special way. We're told, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And even though this came long before Christ's great commission, here John was offering this forgiveness that Christ would win through the water connected with the word. And the reason that John could offer this forgiveness was because he was pointing to the one who was coming right after him. He was pointing to Jesus, who was about to begin his ministry. And John understood that. He said, after me will come who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. John understood how much greater Jesus really was. And the whole reason that Jesus was so great was because when he came into the world, he came as both the Son of Man and the Son of God himself. And because he is the Son of God, Jesus was able to keep himself pure. He didn't just puff himself up and, and wrap himself in Christmas paper so that he could look good on the outside. Through and through, Jesus was righteous. Even the thoughts and motivations of his heart were perfect. But as the Son of God, Jesus not only came to live in the righteousness of God, but he also came to offer a gift that no one else could give. All those ceremonial laws that, that the religious leaders took pride in, who, which they tried to use to puff themselves up, well, those were laws that really pointed ahead to Jesus because all those sacrifices that were offered over and over again in the temple pointed ahead to that one sacrifice for sin that Jesus would be willing to offer for each of us. As we read in the letter to the Colossians, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the reality, however, is found in Christ. Jesus completed the work of salvation by offering that once-for-all sacrifice so that our debt and sin could be paid for, so that through his sacrifice we could be brought to oneness with God. And just as John the Baptist shared that forgiveness that Christ would establish when he, when he baptized, when he proclaimed that message of repentance and forgiveness, God shares that incredible message of forgiveness with us too. And one way that he does it is through something that's very similar to what John was doing, through baptism. When we come before the Lord, even though a lot of us were little babies when it happened, the water connected with the Word did incredible things. By God's power, it, it, it marked us as God's own children. By God's power, it took us from being lifeless stones, dead in transgressions and sins, and washed us clean so that we could live as a part of God's family. Peter writes in his first letter, Baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not just an outward sign, but it's a means of grace through which God communicates to us the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And as we live in this new life that God has provided for us, that he communicates to us through the gospel and the word and sacrament. That's how we prepare for Christ's return. Not by trying to get ourselves ready, not by trying to, you know, 
wrap ourselves up in Christmas paper so we look nice and shiny or, or wrapping Christmas lights around our heads so we twinkle. But God prepares us by giving us this righteousness that only Christ can offer. And not only that, as we prepare for Christ's return, we can proclaim that same message that John the Baptist spoke. We can proclaim that message of repentance so people can, can see their sin and in turn come before the Lord for the forgiveness, the grace, the life that he has given to us. And so during this busy month, when we have so many things to prepare for, or for that matter, throughout the year, when we always have something going on, May we take time to prepare spiritually, to meditate upon the grace that God has given to us so that we can prepare once again this year to celebrate Christ's birth, but also so that we can prepare to celebrate that day when Christ will return in glory. Amen. The way this grace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus our Lord. Bestow on us His grace With blessings rich provide us And may the brightness of His face To life eternal guide us that we his saving health may know His gracious will and pleasure And also to the heathen show Christ's riches without measure And unto God convert them Yours over all shall be the praise And thanks of every nation And all the world with joy shall raise The voice of exultation Judge the earth, O Lord You will not let sin flourish Your people's pasture is your word Their souls to feed and nourish In righteous paths to keep them People praise your worth In all good works increasing The land shall plenteous fruit bring forth Your word is rich in blessing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit bless us. Let all the world praise Him alone. Let Solomon all possess us. Now let our hearts say Amen.
After thousands of years of waiting and praying, hoping and straying, a very special proclamation was made. It was the very first Christmas sermon, in fact, from an angel to a congregation of shepherds, to be exact. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Did you notice? Not just a helper or a teacher, not just a mentor or a preacher, but a Savior. A Savior to earth he came to free us from hopelessness, guilt, and shame. Now that's a Savior worthy of fame. Be our guest this Christmas.